Okay, next we have uh, Kurt Goethe, and he's not able to be here, uh, either in person or via Zoom, uh, but we're going to listen to his presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kurt Gooch, and I work uh, in the dairy sustain or the sustainability company Tratera under Orlando Lakes. Um, my, Roger Katie and myself uh, worked previously together on looking at uh, um, quantifying greenhouse gas emissions for U.S. dairy farms from a big picture perspective. And so, I'm going to share with you some of the information we put together. So. Um, we know back uh, just in 2020, the U.S. dairy industry made three environmental stewardship, um, set three environmental stewardship goals for itself, carbon neutral or better, um, which is became greenhouse gas neutral, optimize water use while maximizing recycling and improving water quality by optimizing utilization of manure and nutrients. So um, equally important, they committed to, so those are goals, but they committed to reporting our progress towards the goals every five years starting in. 2025. Um, there's a lot to figure out and far to report on progress on the greenhouse gas neutrality goal. We know dairy farms emit greenhouse gases from barns, open lots, manure storages, cropland, and even um, under LCA um, procedures, um, um, emissions associated with uh, upstream uh, scope three, if you would, from the dairy perspective, uh, products are included in an analysis. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, when we think about quantifying a, a dairy farm a, or the U.S. dairy region from one extreme to the other, we break it into four areas. We call them prints, um, enteric feed, mineral, and energy. And then this is, again, from cradle to farm gate. So inputs to the farm are included as long as they're meaning, meaningful input uh, missions. Um, the uh, enteric print is associated with the uh, producing milk on the dairy, which would is methane coming out of the cow barns due to the natural digestion system the dairy cow has. Um, we also think about the um, uh, feed that's required um, for those dairy cows, whether they're in a barn or, I'm sorry, whether it's homegrown or if it's purchased. So we got to quantify the greenhouse gas footprint for both homegrown feeds and purchase feeds. So homegrown feeds would be forages mostly. Um, we also have manure to manage. And uh, manure print includes the energy associated with mixing long-term manure storages like shown here on this uh, picture um, and energy to re required to transport that manure out to uh, land for application following uh, nutrient management planning. Um, and so the emissions associated with the energy for that are all included up, uh, uh, up to the point where um, the manure is actually applied. Um, of course, we have greenhouse gas emissions, methane, namely coming off the long-term storage. It's in there as well. The farmstead energy print um, is the energy to run the farmstead, which are the buildings and related infrastructure. I failed to mention a minute ago that the feed print, the feed print also includes the energy for the cropping enterprise. Um, so that's the way we've broken out very strategically, no over overlaps, um, and um, thinking about how best accounting per practices could be used to uh, get the information needed. On an LCA, there's a functional unit. Um, and so for dairy, um, total emissions, a functional unit would be million metric tons of CO2 annually. So that could be for state, per region, um, or for the United States. A, the intensity, which would basically take in that in total emissions and dividing it by the milk for that same breadth of analysis um, on a fat and energy corrective a fat and protein corrected milk basis, and that gives us an intensity value. So dairies, U.S. dairies' goal is to be um, greenhouse gas neutral. That's a total um, total emissions basis. It's not on an intensity basis. So um, applying life cycle assessment procedures um, to to a dairy is a is a challenging task. Um, LCAs were originally developed for um, mechanical systems and have been uh, broadened to include biological systems like dairy. Um, there's four major components of any LCA. There's a scope and goal. Um, so you have to establish the scope and a goal of the analysis, basically do an inventory assessment, if you would, um, and calculate you know, emissions um, and, other, and, and whatnot, uh, and get to the point where you are interpreting results. So an LCA, uh, proper LCA includes footprints for at least 
greenhouse gas, what are use and what are quality. Um, what we're going to focus on is a footprint analysis um, for greenhouse gas. The data is a big topic. So what data goes into the inventory analysis um, is what we're going to spend a lot of time on for the rest of this uh, few minutes we have. The uh, greenhouse gas footprint, um, there's two approaches to get the data. Um, we could survey the farms and then we could do a bigger picture approach um, where we use USDA and other large data sets and borrow on our knowledge of, of, of uh, and strengths of knowing of cows and milk production. So let's talk about the farm survey approach first. Um, any surveying, you basically have statistical requirements needed to ensure valid results, random sample selection, representative cross-section of the dairy industry, um, classical, statistic, classical statistical requirements require uh, normal distribution about the mean. Um, when we have a lot of variation, we have to have a sufficiently large sample of the population. Um, and we do have a lot of variation in the dairy industry. Uh, percent of the cow, what we, one of the things that uh, came out of this work is to, 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 to do this correctly, the percent of cows surveyed and percent of milk surveyed needs to be the same. To, be, to avoid a lot of scaling error. I'll talk about that in a minute. But overall, these requirements are extremely difficult to fulfill by sampling of a system as large, diverse, and complex and dynamic as the U.S. dairy industry. So um, consider these things. Uh, uh, dairy herds aren't not, or are, 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 is the dairy herd sizes isn't really distributed. 80% of the cows are in 20% of the farms. Um, overall, um, milk production is higher on larger farms, and I just stress overall there's always small farms that make a lot of milk too. But overall, milk production is higher on larger farms and smaller farms, somewhere around between 3,000 and 5,000 pounds of milk per cow per year difference. Um, random sampling of milk and cows is required, but farms are surveyed. So that's a, a problem. And um, the estimated profit probability the percent of cows and, and milk surveyed, if they were surveyed, um, is the same as is, is less than 0. 0.0001. And if it was done annually, it'd be once every 10,000 years. So um, this analysis showed that avoidable, unavoidable and unpredictable error resulted when scaling up sample analysis results to the U.S. dairy population, meaning that the reported carbon dioxide equivalent, CO2e, value would have tremendous uncertainty in direction and magnitude. Um, I took the um, calculator that was developed for this work, um, a random error calculator, that, and specifically for um, milk and cows being surveyed, and ran it in a random fashion um, for every year from 20, every five years from 2020 to 2050, and plotted the results. So can see how the error is below zero, so under predicting greenhouse gas emissions in 2020, all the way up to 2045, where it's 40 some percent above zero. Um, if we had the same amount of uh, same amount of cows and milk surveyed, the percentages were the same, then we would be at zero. So what we're working towards um, a goal, and we're going to report our progress every five years. We don't want this kind of error getting in the way. So in summary, sampling does not suffice to populate a uh, populated national U.S. dairy industry LCA inventory analysis. So what are we going to do? So we have this cow-centric approach, um, and we focus on cow milk data and uh, knowing cow biology, which uh, cow biology is well known because the interest of in many, many decades of, of um, getting more milk out of dairy cows, making them more efficient, and uh, how to feed them based on the feeds that are available and the quality of the feeds. So we're going to borrow on the strengths of knowing the cow and her system um, extremely well and knowing about the milk that's produced in a region, state, or the U.S. and use that as a hub for an um, approach to, to generating data to go into an LCA. So we have our, our, our cattle um, young stock, so replacements, lactating bull, uh, lactating cows, dry cows, and bulls. Um, is uh, and knowing core information about those, so we're going to build off that. So, um, for example, we would know how much milk is made in a in a in a state that's available from USDA, and knowing that amount of milk, 
um, and knowing what's generally available to be fed in that state or that region, then and knowing the nutritional requirements to generate that milk, um, we can basically generate diets. And from the diets, we can basically uh, understand what feed we need to grow, what feed we need to purchase that's common to that region or state um, to make the milk that was produced. So um, we have our feed print. And we know the enteric emissions associated with dairy cattle when they consume feed. That's very that's understood. There's equations out there for that. So from the diets that we produced um, to make the milk that's in the state or region, using the feeds available, um, we, we, we have enteric methane emissions. Um, the same process we use to generate the diets, that same process will generate the amount of manure and the constituents in the manure um, that come from the milk that's made in that state or region. And so knowing something about manure treatment, manure management, manure processing, and how that affects emissions, um, we're able to calculate um, a manure print. And then finally, um, the energy associated running the farmstead, um, there is some information out there, um, but like all these four prints, um, the energy, uh, area can use some more help um, in better understanding how much energy is truly used by dairy farms. So um, there's uh, information needed um, for all this work. Some of it's very well understood, which is our hub um, and our manure processing. Um, our crop side um, is fairly well understood, except there's a little pesky emission emissions from cropland called N2O that can happen. Uh, and there's a lot of work um, to better understand that. So overall, we have a very solid hub and a very solid approach from that hub to calculate the uh, all four prints. Um, we also know um, the, the, on the renewable energy side from manure, we know how much um, biogas and what the concentration of methane is in that biogas. Um, from the from farms that have digesters. And so since we know what's in that manure from those diets, we can calculate the contribution of renewable, uh, renewable energy from farms to reduce their energy footprint, i.e. reduce their energy emissions. We also know the NP and K in the manure from those diets, and we apply that back on the cropland. So we take into that account too when we look at emissions associated with fertilizers. So those are the four prints, um, our enteric print, our feed print, our manure print, and our energy print. So um, so solid way of approaching this on a big scale basis. Um, we don't have to scale, which is a big thing, because then we eliminate that need for um, scaling a sample results to a population. And as we said earlier, there's a lot of a uh, chance for uncertainty, and not only the amount of the error, but also the direction of the error. So um, the, the cow-focused um, approach um, is, uh, is, is a better way to go um, for many reasons than surveying. So I uh, hope that this was helpful. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, sorry I was not to be able to be there in person, um, but uh, you're welcome to contact me at the email address below if you'd like. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye.